Hey there folks, welcome to Spectrum Pulse. You talk about music, movies, art, and culture. And today we're gonna to be talking about the third self-titled album from American Football. You know, I think there was a lot of people who just kind of forget that emo was a thing in the 90s. Now granted, this is material I had to rediscover years later. I certainly wasn't that cool when I was eight or nine. And again, it was underground, I wouldn't blame you. But if you were in the right circles, there was a vibrant reinvention going on after the genre kind of went quiet at the end of the 80s. And by the end of the 90s, the genre was on the cusp of a mainstream breakthrough from a certain point of view. And that was a funny thing. For every band like Jimmy World or the Get Up Kids or God forbid Dashboard Confessional actually moving units, there was a thriving underground that was pushing the sound and scope of emo into more artistic directions, usually with inroads into the indie rock or college rock scenes. Now many of these acts would lay the foundation for what third wave emo would become today. And in the midst of all this, in 1999, a band called American Football released a self-titled album. Now keep in mind that you could really track the evolution and growth of emo just through some members of this band. The frontman Mike Kinsella was a founding member of Cap and Jazz, who also put out one seminal full-length album in emo before falling apart. But American football was a little different, if only because the ideas felt less organized, pulling from post-rock and free jazz and a windswept tone that lacked the immediacy of most Midwestern emo, but remained just as compelling. It was really a pretty great album. But as such, the alchemy was not built to last. After one album that was destined to become a cult classic, which it did, the band broke up and went on to various scattered directions both in and out of music. So fast forward to 2014. Self-titled albums reissued and a lot of fans lose their shit, especially when there are some hints and rumors the band is reuniting. And to pretty much everybody's surprise, not only did that happen, but they actually released a second album in 2016, a self-titled project right in the middle of the third wave of emo that they inspired. And, well, it was good. Not quite great, but it never needed to be. A more rounded and accessible reunion that owes a little bit too much to Kinsella's long-running solo project, Owen, that had to hit all the nostalgia centers of all the old fans of the first American football album who settled down, got jobs, had kids, and put all their yearning, more earnest impulses in the closet. And so I would argue I was a little more surprised that American football were putting out an album this year. It makes kind of sense that the band would want to see more from their critical resurgence and occult fan base, why not tee into that a little bit more? But you can only milk nostalgia for so long, so with all that in mind, what did we get from the third self-titled album from American Football? <sighs> so you think I'd have more to say with all the preamble here, and more to say about this project, but the weird thing about every single re-listen through this album from American Football, the more I'm just feeling kind of strangely distant from it. It's definitely a departure away from the nostalgia security blanket that they had for their comeback, and a more unsettled experience as a whole, but with every single listen it's hard to avoid some parallels to similar acts in this lane. Less even an emo or post-rock and more looking towards even progressive rock. And again, I'm not saying it's bad. I certainly get why the fans might like this as there's enough here to align with what people like about American football and Mike Kinsella specifically, but given how much this album is venturing away from that old homestead, or at least seems to be, I'd be remiss not to show where this album isn't quite as revolutionary as that breakthrough was once considered. And look, I might as well say it now, we're just going to overshadow this entire review. This album sounds a lot like if a modern Steven Wilson project crossed over with Elbow and opted for more pillowy emo than prog rock or metal, and then forgot the hooks altogether. Now, if your retort to all this is, Wait, this is American football. They've never really given a shit about hooks anyway when so much of their debut was meandering and influenced by jazz and more about cultivating the soundscape than the structure. And you know what? That's absolutely true about the debut. But if you dig into the compositional structure and textures that American football has adopted since they've come back, there's less of that ramshackle sense of experimentation where anything could happen, where the cyclical guitar loops and the meditative groove patterns could swerve abruptly with a verve that might have more patterns to it, but felt a little bit less structured, a little more organic. Whereas on the compositional level, since the comeback, American football has leaned more into established song structures and more studied, measured cadence 
cadences. And while for the first comeback release it was noted for the parallels to Kinsella's solo project Owen, with the increased focus on glittery atmospherics, twinkling keys, supple grooves, and crystal clear production, plus Mike Kinsella's willowy vocal delivery and the addition of female backing singers, and then you got songs like Every Wave to Ever Rise and Doom and Phil Bloom, where the vocal melodies on the hooks just feel like blatant lifts, it's hard not to get the feeling like I could get many of these same ideas from Stephen Wilson's circa hand cannot erase, just with fewer minor chord progressions and less distortion. Now again, normally this would not be a problem, I'm a huge Stephen Wilson fan after all, but instead of following his lead and picking up some actual hooks and making this kind of catchy, something that with every layer of polish the war on drugs also picked up, a valid comparison given similar glistening tones and a lot of midwestern angst, but this album is much more content to meander in extended wistful passages that might feel very pretty and pleasant, but don't really seem to go much of anywhere. Now granted, that might be part of the point, aiming to cultivate more of a searching, reflective mood where the truth comes in muddy shades of grey, colored by well-framed moral ambiguity and depression. But you know what, if you're looking for a note of climax, or clarity, or even brighter contrast, you're not gonna find much of it in a long, melancholic wallow that could really afford a little bit more emotional dimensionality. And what's kinda weird is how you can tell that somebody in the booth might have approached the band mid-recording to tell them, you know, the album's a little bit slow, you might want to turn up the tempos just a little bit, maybe add a bit of an edge back, and while songs like Every Wave to Have a Rise and I Can't Feel You, they add some flattened grind to some of the guitars midway back and ratchet up some of the bass lines, it leads to this weird feeling where there's clearly some tension and intensity in spots of the song, where you're expecting a swerve or a crescendo, but it's a boil that returns to a simmer every time without ever really explaining exploding or even surprising me. Most because the more spacious keyboard and ethereal guitar passages or even some of the flutes, they remain mid-tempo or if they do pick up it's deeper into the mix. Hell, there are tremolo guitar passages on Uncomfortably Numb that are probably the most blatant of the post-rock moves, but never to the point of actually driving the melodic focus. Hell, some of the lingering horns and flutes get more focus than that. And I do place some of the focus, if not outright blame, on some of the vocal lines as well. Again, I get that Mike Kinsella has never been a dynamic or visceral singer, but it's hard to avoid a feeling of wistful but bleary-eyed detachment only exacerbated by the reverb touch female vocals around him. Hell, you got Haley Williams and Uncomfortably Numb, and am I the only one who feels kind of underwhelmed? Getting Rachel Goswell of Slow Dive as a husky backing presence and I Can't Feel You, that makes a little more sense at least, but the self-titled revival of Slow Dive is a comparison that does spring to mind here because there's a similar lack of deeper warmth in the recording and textures overall that I think wouldn't have been amiss, it could have worked. Now normally in emo this would be where I would point to the songwriting and the themes for the added texture and context, especially surrounding some of that lack of warmth and where you're reminded that Kinsella as a songwriter operates more on the principle of scattered emotive and abstract fragments rather than a clear message or narrative. Fractured character portraits that with enough detail to set the scene, but the rest is just thrown into the haze and murk. And I consider this a very high risk, high reward brand of songwriting and emo, where the topics are intensely personal and vulnerable and so heavily reliant on autobiography that normally you want the added detail to paint a nuanced or at least vivid picture. I mean, if you can nail the mood in a couple words or a perfect turn of phrase, you got something spare and powerful, but if you don't, you got moments that feel a little undercooked or maybe even basic. And I'm frustrated to say that American football kind of fall on both sides of the line with this. On the one hand, it absolutely makes sense that this is a colder album given the lingering emotional distance and cavernous fractures and relationships that characterize the eight songs we got here, the chill numbness, it makes sense. And I absolutely think there are some good moments here lyrically. The slow wilting of love across every wave to ever rise, it's heartbreaking. And how sons become their fathers and then flimsily deny responsibility adds a lot of palpable tragedy to uncomfortably numb. Hell, I think there's a seed of even a powerful idea on the closing track, Life Support. How the grief that many men have often been told to set behind us as adolescent or immature 
it hasn't left, which leads to a conflict of how to best express it in a way that provides release and closure and makes sense for being a man. In terms of the relevance of emo for an older, more mature audience, that's potent as all hell. It's a great idea. Shame that there seems like their songs are the mark seems completely missed in pursuing it, like the cloying self-aggrandizement of heir apparent that tries to tap into generational angst, and yet with that child choir outro really comes across as heavy-handed, or the tepid melancholy of doom in full bloom. And then there's that line on Mind to Miss, which is way more revealing than it probably should be. I need a maid or another mother more than the strain of an absent lover. Which, yes, reflects the regression that he so desperately wants only for the final line to highlight how he has to keep moving forward. But you would think for some of those steps forward, there would be some resolution or clarity or at the very least more coherent questions, not this lingering, dreary blur that apparently has some mommy issues to deal with. But look... I can imagine if you followed thus far, you're probably just waiting for me to call this album boring and move on. But the truth is that I'm more kind of disappointed by a series of compelling fragments that should feel like a lot more than the sum of their parts. This is American Football's longest album to date with the fewest songs, and I can clearly tell there has been a progression. Hell, there are some potent ideas thematically and instrumentally with where that time it could have been well used. But instead we get melodies that rarely progress compellingly and add little texture, ideas and subtlety that reflect maturity or maybe even deconstruction, but not wanting to challenge that cult audience that much to examine them more fully, even despite being all the more time to do so. For as much as the house is not on the cover of this album in any way, that legendary house, this is not an album that is out of its shadow, at least not yet. And with all that, yeah, I'm giving it a 6 out of 10, really just for the fans at this point. Again, not bad, but... I really wish this was better. At least I think it should be. So yeah, thanks a lot for watching. Like to like and subscribe, I'd be more than grateful. My god, filming this was living hell, but hey, if you want to buy or stream it, links down there below. And I got the poll up there. I am curious where some of you guys might fall on this, because I can imagine that it might be a little bit controversial, me giving the score the way I did. But hey, anything else I might be able to do to improve my presentation, I'm all ears. And if you want to help support the channel, link to my Patreon right over there. But till then, I'm Mark, you're watching Spectrum Pulse, and I'll see you next time.